Coming up next, the front man from a beloved 80s rock band breaks down one of the band's signature songs. It's a song that put them on the map and actually started their rise to play stadiums later on. The singer and guitarist, they actually met at a warehouse where the guitarist was jamming with his new band. The singer just asked if he could belt out a few songs, and it was so electrifying, the two decided to collaborate right then and there, form a band. After they had this first hit, some people read a little bit too deeply into the lyrics and claimed the song was about, get this, sadomasochism and bondage. This shocked the singer and guitarist. The band clearly didn't write about this, but now it's become lumped in with that. The interview and stories coming up next on Professor of Rock. Hey, music junkies, professor of rock, always here to celebrate the greatest artists and the greatest songs of all time. Tell you what, if you ever ordered disappearing ink or uh, x-ray glasses from the back of a comic book, you're gonna dig this channel of pure musical nostalgia. Make sure that you subscribe below right now, click the bell so that you always know when our new ones are dropping. Also, make sure to check out our content on Patreon that helps us keep it a daily channel. And check out our new merch. We got a Professor Rock logo shirt with your name on it. So I'm excited to bring you yet another episode from our great series, Revelations, one of my favorite shows we do on here, where featured artists go deep on the greatest songs and albums, stories you won't find really anywhere else. Today we're getting the direct story of one of the early 80s great hard rock songs straight from the singer. It's Turn Me Loose by Loverboy with singer Mike Reno. So this song was written by guitarist Paul Dean and singer Mike Reno after they met at a warehouse. Uh, after jamming together, they knew they had to be in a band together. And they wrote this scorcher not long after. Well, it just so happens that in the years following, uh, the S&M leather community decided that there were sadomasochistic overtones in the lyrics. They thought the lyrics about being tied down, being on your knees, and so on, made the song an anthem for their, uh, let's say, activities. Of course, Loverboy didn't intend this at all, and we're really shocked at this interpretation. Even more shocking is the fact that the song is part of the playlist for uh, the so-called dungeons where this kind of s &M activity takes place. <laughs> oh, boy. That's about as far as I'll go into uh, that particular subject. <laughs> In the book MTV Rule the World, Loverboy guitarist Paul Dean said that the making of the music video is really interesting because the director, he thought this song was a parody. So he wanted to make the video a comedy, even though the song was written as a serious takedown about an unfaithful woman. But the guys didn't really protest it, knowing that the marketing of MTV was going to be very powerful. This song also uh, is a funny soundtrack to a scene in the film Wet Hot American Summer. I'll give you a little view of this. In this interview, Mike also tells us how the band got their name and the origin of the headband trend that he set back in the day that everybody from Mark Knopfler to Bruce Springsteen to Mary Lou Retton copped. So let's get into this interview with Mike Reno. As we do, I want to thank our sponsor, Zenny Eye, where the glasses I always wear on this program. Tell you what, right now, it's a great time to order glasses. You're going to want to enhance your look, add a little style to your life. Click on the info button right up here to get up to 80% off regular retail prices. Make sure that you go to this link to get our special POR deal. Here's Mike Reno. At the beginning, you were rejected by many American labels, and with the demo, were there any, what were the songs on that demo that you had sent out that were rejected? That Were any from your first album? Absolutely. Probably six of the songs from the first album. I'm going to say, uh, well, the kid is hot tonight for sure. Always on my mind. Uh, Prissy Prissy, which was great, because we had this kind of a funky thing going with that song. Um, and then we had kind of a, a new new age or a punky thing, punk rock thing going with The Kid Is Hot Tonight. And then we we put Turn Me Loose in there and it was kind of like, whoa. A lot of people wrote back and said, we've never really heard songs like this, but we're not interested. And I go, wow. what is the deal? And it took them, 
Yeah, it took them a long time. Management a long time. They kept inviting people back to town and saying, here, you know, here they are, they're playing in the club. And I said to the guys in management, I said, they come to see us in these little small clubs. I said, is that really the best way to show us off? And they went, well, that's what you're doing. So we ended up getting a, a gig at a bigger place. Um, it just was, it was an awesome place called The Body Shop. And it was right downtown Vancouver. And it was the number one spot for everybody to go. And we developed a bit of a following so that when, before we came on stage, there was a kind of lineup down the down the street to get in the club because it was, we were kind of catching on just from playing around town, which was cool because we only played our own music. And most of the people back then would play a bunch of other music and throw the, one of their own songs in every once in a while. We, we never did that. We just played all, all original music the whole time. Some of the stuff we never ever even released and maybe could do, but back then we wanted to show it off and we got a um, Jeff Burns from uh, Columbia Records. He came to see us. He was working out of Toronto and he came to see us and he thought we were, uh, we had something going on and he, he offered us a contract and it was like, oh my God, all we wanted was enough to go in the studio and cut a record. So our management team kind of worked it out so we could get a producer that would work for, you know, that much money and, you know, we got a studio that would lock us out and let us record. I think we did the whole project in like five weeks, start to finish. And um, it was the first project uh, that we, for uh, uh, Bob Rock was our engineer. Mike Fraser was the second engineer. And Bruce Fairburn was the producer. And these were up and coming guys from Vancouver. Um, and now they're like hugely famous guys, but uh, you know what I mean? So it was a kind of a head start. It was a start for, for all of us. It wasn't just a start for Loverboy. It was a start for Bob Rock, Bruce Fairburn, Mike Fraser. Uh, Little Mountain Studios became famous from it. I mean, the whole thing. And then shortly thereafter, all these musicians were coming to town and recording there, you know, Motley Crue, Bon Jovi, Metallica, whoever. I don't know if Metallica, you know what I mean? And um, Aerosmith, the, the call. To well, that debut album, a lot of people don't realize, it sold a million copies just in Canada. Yeah, it was pretty huge. Gosh, and huge. two times platinum in America. And at that time, you guys were touring a lot. There were like 200 shows. You said uh, Cheap Tricks, Easy Top, Def Leppard, Kansas, so many bands that you were touring with. Let's jump in and talk about one of my favorite songs you guys ever did, Turn Me Loose. And I knew that that was on the demo that you'd sent that was rejected. And in my mind, I'm just thinking, how could somebody hear that and not say that's a smash? Because it just didn't sound like any rock song at that time. Make it love to whoever I please. Number 35 in the U.S. in early 82, also number six on the rock charts. But it was big worldwide. I mean, it was number five in New Zealand, number four in South Africa number three in Australia. So it was it was all over the place. Of course, written by you and, and Paul. Tell me about the process of writing that, because there's that strong synth, unmistakable synth when you first hear it. Well, we had a keyboard player we were working with, which is still the keyboard player now, Doug Johnson. And basically the song started with hi-hat and bass drum. I played it on bass to the point where it drove Paul Dean crazy. He said, if you play that song one more time, that, that riff, he says, I'm going to smash that bass over your head kind of thing. And I said, well, why don't you write some guitar around it, right? It was kind of like a challenge. It was almost like he was mad at me for keeping, I kept playing the riff. And I knew the drum part because I'm a, I'm a drummer. And then I was playing it on bass. And finally, he started, you know, chiming in. And when it came time to, to demo it, we, we, we put a keyboard right in the front. It was kind of reminiscent of a song uh, Paul did with uh, Street Heart, but completely different, just the same kind of thing where it was a keyboard intro. Mm -hmm. And keyboards were really quite you know popular right then. The cars were big on the keyboards and uh, groups like that were, were coming out with you know, really big keyboard. So we wanted to mix. And what we wanted to do was have the guitar and the keyboard kind of counter each other. 
So that's kind of why it's, it, it, if you listen to the song, you'll hear the guitar will be playing one thing and the piano will be giving a and da and da and da, you know, that kind of thing. And it's just a, kind of a building piece. Um, it was a song that maybe on the demo wasn't exactly the same as when we put it on the record because I had uh, put that song, the band had put the song away, we'd finished recording it. And I was driving around one night and I popped by the studio, Paul was playing some guitar parts. And I asked Bob and Bruce if they'd put Turn Me Loose back up, I want to re-sing it. And they just went, get out of here, you know, what are you, crazy? He said, it's fine, it's great, we got it, plus we can, we got Paul up here. And then if we'd have to do the whole align the tape, which is something people don't know about, where you have to put the tape on and align all 24 tracks, and then you had to remix the whole thing and bring the whole thing back up, turn all the knobs and get it all back. And they just didn't feel like doing it. And I just kept bugging them for about an hour, and finally they said, okay, we'll do it. And when we did it, I changed some of the lyrics around, and then I also threw in that scream, just out of nowhere. I don't know what the deal was. I'm gonna pack my bag and, and by the time I'd finished doing it, I was all sweaty, you know, from singing. And I walked outside for some fresh air and I looked up and there was a full moon. And I went, holy shit. <laughs> you know, and tonight's going to be a full moon too. Ah. So I better get on the old, uh, I better record a vocal tonight. <laughs> no kidding. <laughs> I'm a trusty microphone. <laughs> <laughs> That scream is just otherworldly, man. Yeah. Well, it, it was just something, you know, something that happened. Just something that happened. That's kind of cool. You know, I, I know a lot of people talk about how they how they did songs and stuff they came up with. But this is, the you know, what happened to me. It was just a perfectly natural experience. This song, too, is this was back when a song was given space to build and to breathe. And you just don't see that anymore. The vocals have to come right in. It's got to be right. so many seconds to the chorus. I mean, your vocal doesn't come in for 40, 42 seconds, something like that. DJs loved it. Yeah. <laughs> you know, because they could talk over it. Yeah. That's one of the reasons it did so well. DJs loved it. Do you know that song would have probably done much better in the United States had there not been a, uh, what should, how should we say, uh, Columbia Records, a lot of the record companies were trying to get rid of the independent record promoters, which were considered, you know, a little on the, you know, they, they pulled some pretty tricky stuff to get things sure. played. And that's just the way it is. It's, that, it's just the way it was. It probably may be the same still. So when the record promoters, uh, independent record promoters were, were let go by Columbia Records, one of them came in the, uh, in the office in New York I think he was in front of Al Taller, the president of, of, of Columbia Records at the time. And he says, uh, you guys think you could do this without independent record promoters? They said, well, we're going to try because we're tired of, tired of working with you guys, blah, 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 whatever they said. And the guy takes out of his coat, he takes a dart, and there's a billboard on the wall of the president's office because they followed the number ones. He's, and we were charted at, at 39, I believe. You know, he didn't know. He just stood back and he said, I'm going to throw this dart wherever it lands. I'm going to kill that song. I'm going to show you how powerful we really are. And this actually happened. Wow. And the bloody dart landed on Turn Me Loose. God. Jeez. Wow. I know. And it's one of the fans' favorite songs. I mean, it probably boosted everybody to buy the record. Everybody talks about it. Everybody sings every word. But it never climbed the charts. So people wondered why it didn't climb the charts like a lot of other songs. And that's the reason. It's, a lot of people don't know that. That's the reason. Well, that chorus is so great. It was like the perfect introduction for Loverboy to fans or for people who weren't aware of your music because that duo of, of you and Paul Dean and, and Paul... You and Paul just don't get enough credit as far as I'm concerned. You're very underappreciated. I mean, phenomenal vocalist. And Paul Dean is a guitarist. I mean, come on. It doesn't get better than Paul Dean. No, I, I agree with you. He's fabulous. And we do a little Everly Brothers thing where he sings like a third under me on certain parts. So we have this thing, you know, like when it's over, he's singing just under me. And Turn Me Loose, too, he's got this just under me thing. And it's always it was always very comforting having him kind of ghost me just under me. It just made it fatter. And... 
he was never as high as the mix as me, so it was like really kind of, you know, he was ghosting me. It, it was a nice blend, and I, I really appreciate it. It was probably Bob Rock that figured that one out. The background vocals, the female background vocals, brought some soul to that rock and roll, man. I agree. I think that was Bruce Fairburn's doing. He uh, he had a gal, it was a Vancouver gal that was doing all the work, uh, Nancy Nash. And she was uh, she was just fabulous. And she she came in and she just added these parts and Bruce told her what to sing. And we're, I'm sitting there going, wow, this is sounding great. And th it did, the track just built into this enormous track. And you know, by the time they're finished, I'm standing up, I can't even sit down anymore. You know what I mean? <laughs> That's just the way it was. <laughs> well, that chorus, and then at the end, that end chorus where you and Paul Dean, it's almost like you're having this battle of guitar and vocal. And man, that's that's amazing. It's just a showstopper at the end, especially there. I appreciate you uh, uh, liking that. That's kind of cool. Not a lot of people talk about that, but at the end, we are kind of having a little war. I'm singing, he's playing, I'm playing, he's singing over top, I'm singing over top of him, he's playing riffs over and around me. Yeah, pretty cool. That was pretty cool. It was. was. A long time ago, so I'm, I'm glad you brought it up because now I'm, I'm remembering it all now. Well, the music video too, this was early on before MTV, but it had the old movie footage in there. And I got to say that you were the first to rock the headband and everybody <laughs> followed, man. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Do you know how, do you know how I got into the headband? When, remember I told you at the beginning of our talk that, uh, we used to play these smoky little nightclubs and stuff and cram 300, 400 people in. So it'd be pretty hot. And this is back before they came up with the LED lights uh, that they use a lot of times now. Mm -hmm. These are these thousand watt par lamps. Remember these? Oh yeah. And they'd basically bake the, the hair right off the top of your head if they were too close. And a lot of the times they were only about eight feet away because you know, these clubs got low ceilings and you're playing away. I'm, after about the third song, there's so much sweat dripping in my eyes that I can't even see. So on the first break, I, I whipped into the, uh, in this little corner dressing room area they put together for us. And I cut the sleeves off my t-shirt. And I took the, I think there was a black t-shirt and I took them and I put them over my head and doubled them up and just made it look okay. And then I walked back out for the next set and then there was no more dripping in the eyes. And I went, this is what I'm doing. This is what I'm going to start doing. <laughs> Everybody kind of went, "Hey, it's cool with the headband." I didn't even, you know, it wasn't even a, it wasn't a fashion thing for me. It was just a survival thing. I had to keep the sweat out of my eyes. Yeah, it's crazy how it started. No kidding. Well, "Turn Me Loose" is it's way much bigger than its chart position because it's, it's the thing about a lot of your songs is they find their, themselves in pop culture, all over pop culture, and this one. I love how they use it in Wet Hot American Summer. <laughs> That's a great scene. Have you ever seen that? I don't think I have. I mean, they use like most of the song in Wet Hot American Summer. It was a comedy in America that came out. It didn't do very well, but it's become like a cult classic. And it has like Paul Rudd and... Um, Amy Poehler and just a lot of actors that are huge now, but at the time they were all just kind of buddies and they put together this film and it's so funny how they use it. It's set in 1980, I think 81. And so they're using the rock music of that time. It's really right. cool how they use it. Awesome. I'm going to have to check that out. Appreciate yeah. And then used in crank as well. I don't know if you saw that. I love that because he was just kicking the snot out of this guy. <laughs> and Turn Me Loose is just play, looping, just playing all the parts over and over again. And it's like this, and he's ripping arms off and banging. You know, I was, I've always loved his, him as an actor. He's one of our favorite. We love watching him in anything, really, to be honest. Yeah. I was at a sushi place in Malibu with my wife, showing her this amazing place they have called Nobu. Oh, yeah. 
That's that's home with a thirty-five dollar two piece. Yes. Yeah, I'm in Vancouver where you get twelve pieces for eight bucks. But anyway, yeah. we'll talk <laughs> about Nobu another. Well, Nobu time. is like it's the kind of sushi where it ruins sushi for you, really, because it's so good that yeah. after you have sushi after that, it's like eh. But we're there, and Jason is walking by, and I'm like, oh my gosh. And he looks at me, and he gives me a look. At, I wasn't going to say anything, but he gives me a look like, don't you dare talk to me. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't have had it any other way. It was awesome. I felt like I was going to get my ass kicked by him. It was awesome. <laughs> so anyway, I just thought I'd share that. But, but yeah, so also used in a Mr. Lube commercial as well. That's what's great is when they use it in these things, it, it does introduce it to a new generation. And the people that remember it go, oh, man, I remember that song. And it leads them back to because of music being so available, people can just go and pull it up and start listening to it and remember that. But a lot of covers, too. What did you think about the version that Eminem and Limp Bizkit did? Did you ever hear that? I did hear it. I heard it after the fact. And... Uh, I thought it was pretty cool what they did, you know. I've heard I've heard some jazz folks kind of do it, like almost like turn me loose, but I never heard the way these guys did it. And because you know they had a whole thing going on there, and I thought that was cool, um, loved it. And um, there's some girls who did it in Australia. They yeah, young it. divas. Yeah, they did a bang-up job on it. And they hit number 15 on the chart there with it. And then Fahrenheit did it as well. That's an Australian band. Right. The Aussies love it. It became a, a, a gold single, which you don't get often. Gold singles. They're hard to get. I've got one on the wall somewhere in the basement or something. Uh, somewhere. Um, or behind the couch or something. <laughs> <laughs> What's the legacy of that song for you so many years later? How do you... How does that feel to you now so many years later playing it every night and and i love, I love it it's just you know what it is it's just when people hear you're right about the intro when they hear that intro with the hi-hat and the keyboards they know exactly what's coming oh yeah and you could just see them just put the crowd you know because this is really what we do you know for years we've been touring uh and touring is what we do best to be honest with you i find recording just a bit of a chore playing live is just a dream because the crowd loves it we love it we're all getting and they get, getting into it and that is one of the, the pivotal songs of the evening for sure hey thanks so much for watching leave us a comment about mike reno and loverboy in this classic song what are your memories that are tied to this one you can also uh, check out the song. I'm actually going to link to the video below because we talked about the video in this that the director wanted to make as a comedy. Such a great song. Man, I, I miss these kinds of songs on the radio. They just don't make them like they used to. Uh, make sure that you subscribe below if you like our channel, if you want to discuss music, uh, the best music, classic rock, 60s, 70s, and 80s, 90s. Until next time, three chords and the truth, my friends. <laughs>